Hi, and welcome to the latest of the Kavli Foundation's Spotlight Live webcasts, which offer a chance to hear from scientists on the cutting edge of discovery. My name is Kellen Tuttle, and for this hangout, we're exploring planets in other solar systems. Earlier this year, we discussed the more than 1,700 planets that so far have been discovered in other solar systems. Since that last conversation, new planets and new insight into planets have continued to make headlines almost every week. Here to talk about these new discoveries and to answer your questions about the search for other Earths are three forefront planet hunters. Zach Berta Thompson is a member of the MIT Kavli Institute for Astrophysics and Space Research in Cambridge. He's also part of a team that hunts planets that orbit the closest, smallest stars. Bruce McIntosh is a member of the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology, which is based at Stanford University and Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. He leads a team that uses a new instrument on the Gemini South Telescope in Chile to take direct photos of planets outside our solar system. And Marie Yveno is a PhD student at the University of Montreal, who earlier this year uncovered a previously unknown giant planet. It's one of the most unusual exoplanets found to date, with a mass 10 times greater than that of Jupiter, and that orbits its star 2,000 times the distance that Earth orbits the Sun. By the way, before we begin, let me remind you, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please send it to the Kavli Foundation by email at info at kavlifoundation.org, or via Twitter or Google Plus using the hashtag Kavli Live. So now I'd like to begin by asking about one particular exoplanet called WASP-43b. So this is a planet that's about 260 light years away, and it's far from being another Earth. It's this hot ball of mostly hydrogen gas about the size of Jupiter. Um, and just last week, a team of scientists using data from the Hubble telescope released the most detailed map yet of this turbulent planet, uh, revealing quite a bit about air temperatures and about water vapor that seems to exist in the atmosphere. So Zach, I'm hoping you can start us off by telling us a bit more about this discovery and why it's so exciting. Uh, yeah, sure. So it's uh, it's uh, real. It's really a cool thing um, as an observational astronomer to see this result. And uh, part of the reason for that is it's a kind of a new kind of measurement. So we've known about hot Jupiters for a long time ago. These these giant, you know, these gas giant planets that are in very short orbits around their stars. Um, and we've looked at them in the past um, uh, through a method called sort of a, I guess we've looked at their phase curves. And so what, what that means is we've watched as, as um, a hot Jupiter um, orbits around its star. Um, and as the hot Jupiter is you know, going around this very, very, um, very bright star, you can pick up the very subtle changes um, in brightness from the planet as you're seeing the planet's night side, and then you're starting to see the planet's day side to come into view, and then you can see all of the planet's day side, and then, uh, then you see the night side again. So as you watch over the whole orbit of a planet, you're seeing different um, different regions on the surface of the planet. And so we've made that measurement before, too. But when we made that measurement, it was just a kind of a black and white map that we made that gave us how bright the star is as a function of of longitude. So this is, it was cool. It was the first time we kind of mapped uh, an exoplanet's surface. But the new measurements of WASP-43b are really, really cool because they kind of make that map into full color. They just, it's, now we have this very vibrant picture of what the, the surface of another planet looks like. Um, and so here, they watched as this planet orbits around its star, um, and they, act, they took the Hubble telescope and they stared at the star for uh, three of the planet's years. Um, and so that seems like a long time, but the planet orbits a star once every 20 hours. So it's actually kind of a, it's not so bad. Uh, and as they're watching it go around, they, they measure how bright the star is, in, or the planet is, in lots and lots of different wavelengths of light, and lots of different colors of light. And so from that, they can reconstruct this color two-dimensional map of the, of the surface of the, um, the planet. And so that is, that's really cool to me, that you have this just entirely new way of, of looking at an exoplanet system. And so I'm curious to know, so it seems like one of the things that they did manage to map with this 2D color map um, is water vapor. Um, how unusual is that, and what does it mean for water vapor to be on, in the atmosphere of a planet versus kind of the whole water cycle that we have here on Earth? So the cool thing here is, um, is because they have this full color information, um, some of those colors of light um, just, you know, they go pretty much straight through the atmosphere. 
Um, but some of the other colors of light will be blocked by the presence of water in, in the planet's atmosphere. And so you'll see these little dips or divots in the, in the, um, the light of those particular colors. And so they could see that, that feature of water present in the atmosphere of this planet all the way around its orbit, um, throughout its entire orbit. And so, the, so it's not particularly surprising that we see water vapor in the first place. Water is a very, very abundant gas. Um, and so uh, this planet is very, very hot, and so all the water is, is in gas forms. We, we kind of expect that it would be there. But the cool thing about this observation is it allows you to use that water vapor as, as a tool to, to really probe different depths within the planet's atmosphere. So a, um, a, when you're looking in a, a water vapor feature, you're not probing as deep into the planet's atmosphere, whereas if you're looking at other colors, you're probing deeper. And so it kind of gives you this, this three-dimensional structure of the planet because we, we kind of understand water vapor already. Um, but in this, in this particular system, it's just such a beautiful, beautiful data set. And there are these really sophisticated models that they could, they could build up behind that to match it, that we can both explain all the complexity that we see in these new observations and learn a little bit something about, about atmospheric circulation hot Jupiters. Yeah, and for, for example, we should be clear, when we're talking about water vapor, we're meaning 2,000 degrees, you know, ultra superheated steam. And as, as Zach says, it, the fact that that exists is not surprising because water is hydrogen and oxygen, and those are among the top 10 common elements in the universe. But the signature that they are present is very clear, and this, this three-dimensional mapping, both around the surface as the planet rotates and then deep into the atmosphere as a function of, of wavelength of light, lets you map out things like their um, this planet always has one side facing towards its star and one side facing away, and so the side facing towards the star gets incredibly hot, and that drives enormous winds that blow around the planet and heat the, the backside of the planet. And so you can use information from these beautiful spectra and the beautifully resolved maps to try and reconstruct that circulation and see how these, these huge jets are conveying the heat from the hot side to the cold side. Um, and although... So, Kenan, can... you... Oh, sorry. 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 Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, although now we can really only do this for giant planets, um, it took an enormous amount of time on the Hubble telescope to generate this map. In the future, there will be a successor to Hubble called the James Webb Space Telescope, and that might be sensitive enough if we discover them to do this same kind of spectroscopic mapping on planets that are closer in size to the Earth. Maybe not exactly like the Earth, but, but these super Earths that are a little bigger than the Earth if they were close to their star and go undergoing this kind of roasting, you could do the same spectroscopic mapping and understand whether they have water vapor in their atmosphere. And in the case of a rocky planet like Earth, seeing water vapor in its atmosphere would be incredibly exciting. Yeah, that's what I was about to say, Kenan, because you asked the, the link between that and uh, the water cycle on Earth. Well, you should not... It, it's not a, a direct uh, association that you should make because this, remember, is a very hot and very big planet. So it's not like oceans and rain and everything you could could imagine on a rocky planet like Earth. It's it's really about like um, Zach and Bruce said, um, getting to know better about the atmosphere of these peculiar objects. But it's not directly related to um, water and life and everything we know on Earth. But I would imagine that understanding this, this Jupiter-type planet helps us understand, you know, planetary physics in general or, or planet formation. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And uh, I think that the really cool thing here is that there is... Um, I would say this is one of, the, one of the first times when we've, we've looked at a, a transiting exoplanet and we've, put, we, we've gotten this really huge data set um, and we've really been able to explain it from the start. Um, so there, there was a, a paper that came out at the same time as, as these Hubble observations where they use uh, 3D climate models, basically, for, for this planet, where they just put a big ball of, of hot gas near a star and let it go, see what it would do. And, and from the, that very basic start, they pretty much predicted the features that, um, that we're seeing in the, in, in the data. And so that's just a really cool thing to me that we, we, we're at this point that we've learned so much from, from looking at, um, at giant planets, both in transient planets and, and um, directly image planets, that we, we now have this basic understanding of how, how systems work that we can, from scratch, kind of get the, the, the right idea um, of what we should, we should expect from future data. 
So one of our viewers would like to know how common these types of large Jupiter planets are compared to planets like Earth. Do we know that yet? Yeah, so I, I, I can answer for close-in planets, and I'll, I'll let you guys speak about, about farther out planets because you're much more experts. Um, but for these very, very hot um, giant planets in, in very short period orbits, about 1% of stars has, has a planet like this. Um, there's still some debates over that number, but, um, but they're pretty rare. Uh, they're, they're not super, super common things, but they're easy to observe, and so that's why we've, we've focused a lot of our attention on them so far. But as far as, as planets at wider separations go, It's sort of interesting to hear it described that way because I've been in this field longer than my young colleagues have, and so I remember <laughs> we're the only planets we knew about the hot Jupiters because they're so easy to see, and so it was an astonishing surprise that they were as incredibly common as one or two percent of stars um, having this class of planet. But by now, yeah, we know from missions like Kepler that that's not the typical planetary system by any means. What we the number we don't know is still what the number of planets that are that are even remotely like Earth is. Those are still the ones that are just below the sensitivity of the instruments we use. Um, we talked about this the last time, but the, the Kepler mission has shown that there's a huge number of planets out there that are sort of two or three times the size of the Earth, and there's nothing like that in our solar system. There's the Earth, and then there's Neptune, which is about four times the size of the Earth. And so the question of whether those, what those in-between planets are, how common they are, and whether they're more like Earth or more like Neptune kind of remains the the biggest uncertainty we have in um, understanding exoplanet populations right now. And we're trying to push it down to the Earth's size, but, but it's going to take a long time to get there. And more importantly, to do things like this result, where you don't just tell that there's a planet there, but you actually can try to say something about what it's made out of to use tools like spectroscopy to, to measure its composition. So um, we know these things are very common. We really don't know if solar systems like our own are equally, or excuse me, very rare. We really don't know if solar systems like our own are equally rare. Or, or still represent a big chunk of the solar systems out there. However, something we do know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Bruce, is that uh, there are probably much more small planets than there are big planets. That's for we, sure, right? So we know that you extrapolate. Kind of two Earth radius level. Sorry, I didn't mean to speak over you. Um, below two Earth radius, whether they start to get rare or stay common is, is a little fuzzy with the current statistics. Yeah. But yeah, these super-Earths, super-Neptunes are incredibly more common than these, these roasting Jupiters, is something we now know, which is encouraging for the even smaller planets. So digging into this a little bit more, a viewer has also sent a question saying, how common are Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone of red dwarf stars in our galaxy? Ooh, that is, that is a very, very exciting question. Um, because, uh, as I think we talked about last time, if you... Uh, if you do find a transiting planet in the habitable zone of a red dwarf star, then you do have hopes to, to do these kinds of observations to study its atmosphere and learn about its properties. And so, so that's a very, very interesting number. Um, and uh, the best work that I know of on this um, uh, was, was done by Courtney Dressing, who's a graduate student at Harvard, just up the street from there, um, where she used the, the M dwarfs uh, that were observed by the Kepler telescope to estimate um, this, this kind of a number. And her numbers are still, she's revising those estimates right now, and she's finishing up her thesis. Um, but the numbers are significant. It's anywhere from 10% to 50% of M dwarfs have a planet that's kind of like Earth in its, its habitable zone. So I, I won't quote her final numbers yet. Um, but they are, at the very, at very least, they appear to be much more common than hot Jupiters, which is, which is certainly very encouraging. So it sounds like Earth-sized planets are maybe just below the sensitivity level of what we can see right now. But if we were hunting for Earth's twin, you know, what are the main characteristics that we would be looking for? What would you hope to see on a planet that, that is a lot like Earth? And maybe the first thing you'd want to measure is just something as simple as its density to see what its bulk composition is. Um, a lot of planets are turning out to have very low densities, which means that they're not mostly made out of rock and iron like Earth is, but they're made out of ice, water, hydrogen, and so on. So the very first thing you'd want to do is just use the, the combination of the transit techniques and the Doppler techniques to measure its mass and show that its density is consistent with being a, a rocky planet like Earth with a, a real surface. Mm -hmm. 
then probably what you would like to know is uh, about the basic of its uh, atmosphere composition. So you would like to know, for example, if there is water, if there are some other gases that could indicate that there is something going on like life, for example, in the atmosphere. But I guess anything that uh, that you could know about the atmosphere of this planet was would be really interesting. And if there is an atmosphere at all, would also uh, be interesting. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And then at just at the very simplest level, um, there are and probably some of the first things we would be able to to measure would be um, just how big the planet is. We want something that's about the same size as Earth. And how hot the, the planet is, uh, and so that's just that's um, and that's set by how far away it is from its star, and so those are things that are relatively easy to measure, and so uh, uh, so. But once we have have all of these things together, then yes, we would start to be able to say that this is a, a really Earth-like planet. So if we were to turn that question around and say that we're looking at Earth from say you know, 100 light years away, you know, kind of the distance that we're looking at these exoplanets from, you know, what would we be able to tell about Earth from that distance? Would we be able to tell that it can support life? It depends on what kind of instruments you're looking at it. With the telescopes we have right now, um, anything, even Kepler, even the Hubble Space Telescope, we wouldn't even be able to tell Earth is there. Um, you can only see these these Earth-sized planets when they're close to relatively small stars and the geometry happens by an astonishing coincidence to line up so the planet blocks out the star, um, and when you watch it for years and years to see that blocking out happen repeatedly. So to see something that's really like Earth around, really a sun-like star, even as far as 20 light years away, 100 is probably probably optimistic. You need missions that don't exist yet, but that hopefully will over the next 10 or 20 years. And 20 years from now, it's not unimaginable we would have this combination of knowing what the radius of the planet is, knowing what its mass is, and then the hints of spectra in its atmosphere. People have done um, really cool experiments, actually, where they tried to see what the spectrum of Earth would look like by looking at it with a, another NASA spacecraft that happened to be flying far away from the Earth in our own solar system, or by looking at the light the Earth reflects off of the moon. And when you stare at those spectra, people have shown things like that you could tell relatively easily the presence of oxygen in the atmosphere or water. Um, people have done experiments where a, a NASA spacecraft stared at the Earth from a long way away as it rotated and could actually see the Earth getting slightly brighter and slightly dimmer and slightly bluer and slightly greener as oceans and continents came into field of view. So with a sufficiently large telescope and sufficient time, you might actually begin to tell that there were real variations from continents on the surface of the planet and that it had both both water areas and dark areas. Yeah, actually, Marie, weren't you involved I, in some of those experiments? Yeah, yes. I did master thesis. Um, I was using the telescope we have here in in uh, in Quebec. It's called Observatoire du Mont Mégantic. It's a quite small telescope. It has a mirror of 1.6 meter diameter, and we were observing the moon actually because, like Bruce said, uh, the Earth. Um, reflex of the moon so when you look at the moon you can uh, have a, a good idea of what the earth would look like and what is neat is that uh, since the moon is not a perfect mirror uh, it reflects all the light mixed up and that's great because when you will have um, the chance to study the light from a, a distant exoplanet, this will be, uh, it, it won't be a picture of the exoplanet. You won't have any resolution. You will get all the light from one pixel, one, um, one places. So it, it won't be likely that you will be able to, to map it. Uh, so when we were looking at the moon, we were getting information that was uh, looking quite similar to that and we were able like Bruce said to uh, to um, detect uh, quite easily the oxygen and something that was uh, a big hope but that was really really hard to see was uh, to see not that um, it was uh, especially green for example when you see veg uh, vegetation a lot of vegetation in inside but it was especially bright in the near infrared because um, when I, I don't know if you have ever seen a picture taken with one of those near infrared filter but if you haven't look on the web and check for an image of a landscape with, that has a lot of vegetation with a near infrared filter and you'll see that all the vegetation comes in very very bright so uh, that's something that we hope to see uh, maybe in a distant exoplanet, but this is way, way 
uh, far in the future, and we we were we were not even able to detect it for sure on Earth uh, when we know <laughs> uh, what we were looking at. So I think it's this is really um, for the future. <laughs> Great. So we've talked a fair bit about um, the hunter planets that are like our own, and we're getting there, but we're not there yet, is what it sounds like. Um, but there's a huge amount of variation in the types of planets found outside our solar system. You know, for example, a few weeks ago, scientists in Italy announced a discovery about a planet that's as massive as our sun. You know, for comparison, the largest planet in our solar system is maybe one one thousandth the mass of our sun. Um, so it's hugely different. So I'm hoping you can tell us about a few more exoplanets that don't look anything like the ones in our solar system. Uh, I'm quite surprised about this information. I haven't seen it. Uh, have you, uh, Zach or Bruce, the, the planet that has the mass of the sun? Did you know what they mean? I haven't. And so, uh, no, and so usually um, it's not a firm limit, but we usually include like sort of an upper mass limit to what you would call a planet. So something more massive than yeah. about 13, 14 um, Jupiter masses is usually something we don't call a, um, a planet anymore. It becomes a brown dwarf, and if you go bigger and bigger, it, it's a star. And so, I don't know. I'd have to look it up. Um, but yeah. in terms of other <laughs> weird planets, um, there are, uh, I think the ones that, that, that are most exciting right now are these things that are the, the in-betweensy um, planets, the ones that are not quite rocky and not quite uh, gas giants, um, and so there, there's this really, really interesting regime of of planets that we don't even know what to call them. Some people call them super Earths because they're bigger than Earth, um, and some people call them sub Neptunes because they're smaller than Neptune. Um, and so, understanding the, the the composition of those, I think, is is a really exciting place. And so, we, we've only in the past what few is years we've really learned that these planets are good. Yeah, go ahead. What is interesting, as Bruce said, is that this category of planet, I do agree completely, because this category of planet is really, really common. That's what we we understood from our uh, the, the data from Kepler. So it's even more interesting, because we have a lot of these planets that don't exist in our solar system, and that we're not even sure what they're made of. Are they like small gas planet, or are they really big? rocky planet. So that's, for me too, it's a class of planet that interests me a lot and I think all the community is really interested in the new kind of planet. Yes. Sorry, Zach, I interrupted you. Yeah. No? There's also increasing amounts of works um, in the area I work in studying very young planets. Um, a lot of these other techniques aren't good at looking at, at young systems that are only, say, 10 or 20 million years old where their planets are still forming, but things like direct imaging are. And so, there have been groups that have found um, young stars are almost always surrounded by disks of dust and gas, and their people have found evidence of, of things that might be planets in the process of forming in the middle of those disks of dust and gas, the way we think that the planets in our solar system form. that are actually sucking down gas so that a, a planet is swelling up past the size of Jupiter as it absorbs new incoming gas. Or with the Gemini Planet Imager, we looked at a star that's about 10 million years old, so still very young. And although we don't see any planets around it, we can see evidence for an enormous asteroid or comet belt, 10 or 100 times the mass of the asteroid belt in our solar system, grinding up as the um, asteroids orbit around the star and collide with each other and making lots of, of polarized dust. And then we can see right that the edge of that dust ring is extremely sharp, as if there's something invisible to us just inside the dust ring, um, cleaning up all the asteroids, keeping, a, keeping the space cleared out, something like maybe the same way Jupiter keeps the edge of our um, asteroid belt defined so sharply. So now we have a question from the viewers. Oh, go oh, ahead, sorry. please. Please. Yeah, uh, well, another type of planet that fascinates me from my own research is uh, in those young systems, like Bruce was telling, the, the direct imaging method, the one when, where we detect planets uh, by, like, looking at the system and verifying if there is something. Um, there is another type of planet have in our system that th these are, like, the huge planets that are bigger than Jupiter and that are farther also than Jupiter from their own sun. So this is another type of planet that we don't have in our system. You could call them maybe mega Jupiter, whatever you want. But these are quite fascinating to me too because sometimes they are at a distance where, well, they could not have formed like 
planet as we usually um, define them because we usually we think that planet form in the disk that that forms around the star that a young star, but these planets are usually too far. They are at a place where we think the disk is not present or not uh, dense enough to uh, allow the formation of a planet there. So how did they form? How did they end up there? This, these are questions that are in intriguing about this other type of planet that we don't have in our solar system. Sorry, yeah. go ahead with your next question. <laughs> Sorry, I was just going to say that there's a question from a viewer who asks, are there many sun-like stars that are studied? And if so, you know, in those solar systems, are they similar to ours? Is, is ours a typical makeup? It's still the question, unfortunately, that we can't quite answer because our techniques can't see a solar system like our own. Um, there's been more emphasis on studying the M stars lately because they're easier to get to. You can see smaller planets around them and you can see the habitable zone better. But Kepler does provide statistics on planets around sun-like stars, but still it didn't quite reach the point where, where any of the planets in our solar system would have been detectable around the typical star it looked at, unfortunately. Um, it's going to take future missions to really probe the, the sun-like stars in depth. We're just barely at the level where we could see Jupiter around a sun-like star using ground-based telescopes and Doppler measurement. Um, and we're just getting hints of it. One of the, the problems in this field is to see a planet with most techniques, you have to wait until it goes all the way around its star once or ideally twice. Um, <laughs> Jupiter, that takes 12 years um, each time. If you want to see three orbits of Jupiter, um, Zach and Marie are probably young enough that they'll manage to measure that, but, but many of the other astronomers in the field are not. Um, so. <laughs> but we should have started a while ago. We're yeah. Already, we're already ready behind. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so there have been... Uh, oh, go ahead, Marie. The uh, very first measurement of an exoplanet using Doppler technique was in 1995, so um, this this number of year hasn't really passed yet for three years, not yet, I guess, yeah, if you count. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's a pretty young field. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but uh, I guess in terms, just in terms of solar-like stars, they, I would say that they, we've, we've looked at them a lot, but as Bruce said, it's just really hard to find exact Earth-like twins around them. Um, but the, and so, yes, we have been focusing a lot on smaller stars where, where, where more Earth-like planets are, are, um, are easier to find. Um, and so on the one hand, that's a challenge because we're, we're getting out of our comfort zone. We're like, if, if we're interested in, in really figuring out whether a planet has life on it someday, this is still very far down the road, um, then it's on, on one hand, it would be a little bit easier if we were talking about an exact twin of Earth, something that's just like Earth around a, a star like the Sun. We kind of we feel like we might know what we're dealing with. Um, whereas if you put a uh, a similar planet around uh, an Endor, a much smaller star, then it's very different. And so it's a little bit scary that it's that it's um, that it's really a different kind of of system that you're dealing with. Um, but if we do someday have the capability to to detect um, the presence of, of life on, on a planet, I think it would just be so interesting. It would be such a cool experiment to have planets around these much smaller stars. And if we could actually find that there is life around in a very, very different environment than, than Earth, then that's just a really cool test. I feel like we would have, will have learned a lot about what you need for life if, if you um, can populate all these very diverse environments. So to that end, we have a, a number of telescopes kind of that, that are coming online soon or that are in the plans. Um, and Bruce mentioned a few of these before. Um, so we have TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, that'll do an all-sky survey looking for kind of rocky worlds around the closest bright stars. And that'll be followed by the James Webb Space Telescope that Bruce mentioned as well. That'll look at these same planets in more detail. Um, so I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit more about what these telescopes will and won't quite yet be able to tell us that we don't already know. Uh, sure. So on on the test front, at least. Um, so test is basically a, it's a it's doing the same thing that the the Kepler mission did, um, but slightly different. So Kepler was designed to tell us about the statistics of planets. So it looked at one very small patch of the sky. Um, actually, on on the star map behind me, it's a patch of the sky that's about like that that big. Um, uh, whereas TESS is, is going to be looking at the entire sky. So it's going to look at all of the brightest stars in the sky. And what that means is it will find um, not just lots of planets, it will find lots of planets that are easy to observe in more detail later. 
Um, so the closer a star is to us, the brighter the star is, the more light we detect from that star, the easier it is to study a planet that orbits that star. And so TESS is going to go out and find all of the really easy to observe transiting exoplanets. And that will help answer, help give us the right um, exoplanet systems to answer the questions that we have about the masses of, of small planets in this intermediate region, um, all of the, you know, the atmospheres, the evolution, all of, the, all of these cool things that we want to know about. And so TESS is, is really kind of a, a recon mission. Um, and TESS is going to tell us where we should point the other big telescopes that are coming online. And then after TESS finds them, in principle, JWST can use these same techniques like this, this Hubble paper we were talking about at the beginning to study their um, spectra. Um, I wanted to sneak in a, a mention of the, the next mission after that um, that astronomers are starting to plan, which will include exoplanet capabilities, and that's something called WFIRST AFTA, with an incredibly boring acronym that stands for World <laughs> IR Survey Telescope Astrophysically Focused Telescope Assets. But it has an interesting backstory. Um, this will do the direct imaging, which has the advantage that that's the one technique where you don't need to wait for the whole 12 years to see the Jupiter. You just tell it's there and study its orbit. But direct imaging really requires a big telescope. There's almost no point in doing it with a telescope smaller than the Hubble Space Telescope. And five years ago, as astronomers and NASA studied what their, their future space missions could be beyond JWST, they didn't think it was realistic to design or afford a exoplanet hunting mission that was the size of Hubble or bigger. And the highest priority astronomers selected actually had nothing to do with exoplanets. It was to study dark energy and cosmology and the expansion of the universe for which you want just a big, huge um, field of view telescope studying billions of galaxies at once. Um, as they were maturing the design of this, though, another government agency that will remain nameless came along and said that they had a bunch of Hubble-sized telescopes that they weren't using um, sitting in a warehouse somewhere. And they donated two, essentially, Hubble-sized space telescopes to NASA. And NASA decided that these, which were designed in part for wide field science, would be a beautiful match to the Dark Energy W first mission, but also finally get big enough that it's worth considering flying an advanced coronagraph on them. And so studies are going on right now to decide if, if it's feasible to attach astronomer instruments to these other agencies' telescopes, potentially including a coronagraph that again, probably couldn't quite reach the level of seeing Earth-like planets, but would be able to see the real Jupiters around, Jupi around um, solar-type stars, would be able to see the super-Earths around stars that are relatively near to the Sun, and see them directly so that you could get spectra and begin to determine something about their atmospheric composition. And Bruce, these are uh, instruments that otherwise might have been looking down on Earth instead of up and away from Earth, is that That's right? a reasonable interpretation. The, the other agencies won't... <laughs> They we're going to use the telescopes for, but um, that's that's everybody's inclination is to guess that that was what they were um, built for. Got it. Um, so if we're going to be able to see and understand exoplanets even better, obviously we're going to need better tools like the ones you just described, um, and we're going to need some really skilled observations. Um, Bruce, I know you've said that the observing process itself is the best part of the job for you. Um, I'm hoping you can set the scene for us and tell us a little bit about what it's like when you go about planet hunting. Sure. I was going to um, actually see if I can even show some pictures with this, if this system will behave itself. Um, so um, in my case, I'm mostly going these days to Chile at the Gemini Observatory where we deployed this instrument we constructed. So the process starts with agonizingly long plane flights and, and connections and four-wheel drives up twisty mountain roads. Um, <laughs> Here's a picture of what you see when you get there. Modern telescopes are just like the most beautiful machines I have, have ever seen. Old telescopes, too, but they're these incredible pieces of scientific equipment, comparable maybe to the big particle accelerators, except in much, much cooler settings, because they're on the top of lonely mountains. Yeah. Uh, on the left is the Gemini telescope itself, and our planet finder is kind of bolted to the back of it, and then the right is an outdoor shot of the group. Um, the telescope has big vents that are open to let the wind kind of blow smoothly through it so that the inside and outside of the telescope are at the same temperature and you don't get much atmospheric turbulence. So a typical day involves trying to sleep all day, then waking up at, at around dinner time, having dinner, going up to the telescope, getting all the equipment ready, watching the sunset. A typical night mostly involves sitting in a room staring at computer screens, unfortunately. <laughs> don't go. <laughs> but, Staring at those computer screens, you get to see little little um, 
in the you know, images that you can actually look at and say that's an actual planet with your with your eye staring at the computer screen, a little bump that represents a planet um, orbiting around another star. Uh, <laughs> we're all very um, happy and enthusiastic about it. And then the <laughs> worth of, of kind of analyzing this data in detail, working to improve the instrument, working to interpret the results you're getting, working to pick stars that you're looking at, but also occasionally going out to actually look at the stars and remind yourself that, that um, it's not just all about the computer screens. A gorgeous picture by my collaborator Marshall Perrin, um, where you can see the Magellanic Clouds and the Milky Way, and the Gemini Telescope open behind us. And Marie, if you're actually in Hawaii right now to do some observing, is that right? Yeah, it's right. Um, I'm at the Canada France Hawaii CFHT telescope, um, and I have the chance to be invited here because it's it's my actually first observing. A a major observatory, as I said before, the chance to use the Observatoire du Mont Mégantic in Quebec. Now it's my first time that I'm actually on site, um, and um, I had the chance to do that. And it's it's incredible for me to see how things work in the major observatory first at the CFHD. Something that is quite surprising for me is that. Uh, well, you could, you can go up of the mountain here in the wild, which is called the Mauna Kea, which also hosts any other great instrument. Um, there, there is the Gemini North, the little twin of the, the telescope Bruce just talked about, that is just beside CFHT. You can go there, but actually all the observations are made from here in, in a town called Waimea, which is... Uh, on the bottom of the mountain, it's not at the top of the mountain, and we're do, we're carrying all the observation remotely, um, and uh, it's it's all going very very smoothly. It's really impressive for me to see uh, how it works, and it's it's a bit like Bruce described. So you. Uh, you you try to sleep during the day because by night you have to to take the most of the the dark time the time where it, there is no sun and um, here in Hawaii we are blessed by a wonderful weather especially compared to Vex weather um, it's it's incredible the the number of hours we actually get to to observe at the telescope and that have a very very nice condition because we are so high in altitude that we don't have a lot of uh, of the like weather pattern interfering with us, some like most of the time the clouds are below the mountain. You can see them when you are at the top, so it's great. <laughs> when you go high enough, it's it's always uh, a nice temperature. <laughs> well, thank you for being up today during the day for this call, um, <laughs> Zach. And how about you? I mean, do you have a most memorable observing moment that you can tell us about? Uh, yeah. So, so I've. I've um... I've been to a few different observatories, and, and I always love it. It's just it's such a it's such a thrill, this excitement of of getting yourself on a nighttime schedule and, and staying up late and, and taking data and seeing things that you um, that nobody's ever seen before, right? You're like you're you're um, this is you're taking probably the best picture that's ever been taken of this star or the best spectrum or the best you know you're doing something new, um, and so that's that's really really exciting. Um, there's while I was a grad student. Um, I did a lot of work on a, a robotic telescope survey, though, and that's kind of different. So the telescopes observe without you, and so they observe every every single night whether or not you were there. Um, and there, there were some slightly less glamorous moments um, where my interaction with the telescope was mostly to go like shoo the ring-tailed cats out of the the telescope dome and and clean up the, <laughs> the little gifts that they had left for me around the um, around the telescopes. Um, so, so at that moment, you know, maybe maybe observing wasn't the the, the best thing in the world, um, but most of the time, it, it really is just it's a thrill, especially at these these very big telescopes where um, where you're seeing this just these incredible feats of, of engineering um, making making cool observations happen. So. And the skies are incredible. It is just like really really cool to be at a dark site and to be able to go out and look up and see. Um, the whole universe uh, above you. That's, that's really exciting. Well, we're absolutely in an incredible era of discovery. Um, Zach, Bruce, Marie, Eve, I'd like to thank you so much for helping us understand what we know and, and what we hope to soon know about planets beyond our solar system. Um, thanks, too, to all the viewers who joined us and who asked their questions. Um, if you'd like to see this webcast again or if you want to share it with your friends, it'll be available almost immediately on both the Kavli Foundation website and on YouTube. 
And if you want to learn about future webcasts, please follow the Kavli Foundation on Twitter. Our handle is at Kavli Foundation. Thanks again for watching.